Uh, we're going to be coming back to them for answers to these questions which you've very kindly been giving us. Uh, but right now, we're going to have a bit of fun. For the latecomers, uh, I would just like to tell you that I'm now going to present a case, a real case, presented to my clinic. The panel very bravely have agreed not to look at the slides beforehand, so they have no idea what I'm going to show them. I'm going to stop the case at various time points, and I'm going to ask them where would they go, what would they do next, that, that kind of thing. These are highly experienced clinicians, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm quite sure that in times to, to come, they will look back at this this afternoon, and they will say to themselves, if I may paraphrase Winston Churchill, this was my finest hour. Of course, it could go the other way. We're just going to have to see. So this is the first case. Oh, this is the case, actually. Miss AJ, presented age 14, severe menorrhagia and epistaxis, a microscopic hemochromic anemia, platelets of less than 25, found to have IgG antiplatelet antibodies. She was admitted to a hospital just north of where I work in the center of London and diagnosed not, I think you would agree unreasonably, with acute idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. She was treated, this being the bad old days, with steroids, 40 milligrams per day, but after nine months, there was no improvement, and she was subjected to a splenectomy, which was highly successful, and indeed it was a pretty successful form of treatment, and nowadays, of course, we would tend to use rituximab for patients like her. She remained well for approximately 10 years, and then she accompanied her mother on a trip to Bombay. The family came from India, and they were going to go back to the ancestral home, which she'd never seen. It was extremely hot, 40 degrees, and in fact, she then developed a temperature of around 40 degrees. She had sweats, she had weight loss, she had arthralgia. She returned to London, where she was admitted to a wonderful institution that we have there called the Hospital for Tropical Diseases. And I've been going there on and off for 25 years, and I've only ever made two diagnoses when I go down there. Certainly in the old days, you would get asked to see a patient whose notes were about that thick, with every kind of tropical uh, antibody test done under the sun. And I only ever made two diagnoses when I went down there. One was lupus, when I got the ANA checked and it was positive, and one was adult onset stills disease, when I checked the ANA rheumatoid factor, and it was negative. They all got treated with steroids anyway, but those were the two diagnoses that I made. She was extensively investigated for tropical disease. No tropical disease was found. Her pyrexia persisted. She developed frank polyarthritis. She had alopecia, quite significant alopecia, a very high sed rate, and the ANA, which naturally I checked, was strongly positive. She has antibodies to Rho, she has antibodies to La, she has lupus anticoagulant positive, and I hope you would agree we now have enough criteria, even by the new methods, uh, to make a diagnosis of lupus. So my questions, and we'll start with Michelle, if I may. What percentage of adolescents or young adults with ITP, in her experience, or from her reading, go on to develop lupus? We'll ask Maureen about what percentage of patients with lupus have thrombocytopenia. Uh, we'll ask Dr. Cardiel what types of thrombocytopenia occur in association with lupus, and perhaps they'll ask the whole panel, what percentage of patients with lupus, in their experience, have severe thrombocytopenia? So, Michelle, any, any feeling about the numbers of patients who present with ITP who then go on to get lupus in your experience? I'm sure there's an evidence-based answer, <laughs> but I, I would just guess that probably about 10 to 20 percent. Okay, that's great. And Murray, what, what percentage of patients with lupus, in your experience, have, have thrombocytopenia? Well, let me go behind that question that Michelle answered. Oh, yeah. We had the opportunity to review in Mexico more than 100 patients who underwent splenectomy for PTI. Uh-huh. And uh, we, we tried to detect how many of those will develop SLE in the future. And the, the answer future. was? One out of eight. One out of eight? Yes. So about 12 and a half percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Murray, come back to Thank the God. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the question about thrombocytopenia and lupus. Overall percent? Yeah, roughly. In our cohort, it's 15%, but they, uh, they divide themselves. This may be the answer to your next question. They divide themselves into two categories. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So the largest category by, by far are what we call the benign thrombocytopenia. So these are people who run with platelet counts between 50 and 100, 110,000. They're never bothered by it. They, we don't treat them. Right. We follow them. Um, and they're the majority. There is a small minor, smaller minority <clears throat> in whom the thrombocytopenia goes down around 10,000 or less. 
that's usually associated with active lupus elsewhere, Absolutely. and that's a bad yeah. prognostic uh, right. indicator. So in the interest of time, we'll, we'll just go through to the answers for those questions. Uh, and in fact, you can see that the panel did a fantastic job. Uh, the best study I'm aware of was published over 30 years ago, so it really is timely. Somebody wants to do a bit of research. Carl Patkin's study showed 3 to 15% ITP patients developing lupus uh, over a 20-year follow-up period, pretty much in line with what the experts have just said. Uh, Kismorio in the Du Bois textbook estimated that the range of thrombocytopenia was around 14.5 percent, almost exactly in line with what we've just been told. Uh, and I, have a, I actually have a slightly, distinct, slightly dis different view from Murray in, in that, in my view, you, you can get severe acute, which is exactly what Murray has said, chronic persistent. Now, my experience is often linked to phospholipid antibodies, and of course you've got the ITP to lupus patients. And severe thrombocytopenia, less than 5 percent. I, I think everybody would agree with that. Thank you. Okay, let's carry on. The patient was treated with steroids and with Plaquenil. Now, one of my colleagues, uh, then a junior colleague, uh, was observing this patient's uh, previous record and was concerned to discover that when she had the splenectomy, no vaccinations had been offered to her. She was therefore offered an H influenza vaccination, and four days later, she called us up complaining of numbness in the feet with burning pain. She had an EMG, which was reported as showing an F wave, which is said to be compatible with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And on examination, she had very clear bilateral foot drop. So the questions to the panel are, what do you think is going on here? Lupus patient, been given a vaccination, now presented with these neurological features. So what's going on, and what should we do about it? Any, any thoughts? Uh, this patient has been treated with high-dose prednisone, and mm -hmm. also she has antiphospholipid antibodies and, and, and positive anticoagulant. Yep. So we should be very aware about thrombotic events in these patients. Okay, so we've uh, got a concern about that. What about the vaccination, Murray? Do you think that could be linked to uh, what's going on here? So uh, I think uh, there are two issues here. One, we do have patients, uh, two, who have a classic Guillain-Barre syndrome in the face of active lupus elsewhere. And so in those two patients, we said, okay, this is lupus, and we treated the lupus in general, and they both resolved, but Guillain-Barre generally resolves anyway, so yep. it's hard to know. Okay. However, there are reports of Guillain-Barre after vaccination, so Perfect. was she unlikely and unlucky enough to have a second complication? I think I would go on the basis of what else was going on. If the lupus was active, I think it was more likely lupus-related, not vaccine-related. Okay. And may I add that it's both okay, okay yeah. and actually standard of care to give these inactivated vaccines. So nothing was done incorrectly here. And I would right. be hard pressed to actually blame that vaccine. It's usually older influenza vaccines that were associated with Guillain-Barre. Okay. And I must say, I never ever understand EMG nerve conduction study reports. So I want to go talk to the person who interpreted it I want to make absolutely sure that it was Guillain-Barre and that it wasn't a mononeuritis multiplex that happened to be bilateral. I think Michelle makes a very good point because this, the thing that we were struggling with here was was this actually Guillain-Barre or was this lupus with nervous system involvement? And what was in favor of it being Guillain-Barre was the EMG report, this so-called F wave, though it now turns out this is not quite as specific as the EMJologist initially claimed. There is some kind of an ascending motor neurologic problem here, and as Murray has pointed out, there are indeed previous reports uh, of Guillain-Barre following H. influenzae vaccination, but this patient's uh, CSF protein, which we checked, was actually normal. Why would we think more in terms of this being lupus with CNS involvement? Well, it's a mixed sensory motor problem. Guillain-Barre is principally motor, of course. She has a persisting fever. This patient also had low white cells, low platelets, hemoglobin, and C3. Uh, but in fact, her DNA antibody was normal, though the other side of that is, of course, at least a third of lupus patients have normal DNA antibodies throughout their, their, their time. The problem was largely solved in a practical sense because in the middle of a lupus clinic, when we used to do them on a Thursday morning, I got called over to the ward because the patient had just had four grand mal seizures. So not much doubt, really, this is actually CNS lupus that we're dealing with. And we treated with the increasing dose of steroids. She got IV cyclophosphamide every month for three months. She had some azathioprine switched after that. She was given some Tegretol, and she had a CT and an MRI scan, which was reported as showing widespread vasculitic lesions. Now, I want to ask you a question. This is the, for the audience now. Answer A, if you believe that imaging report that this scan showed widespread vasculitic lesions. B, if you're not sure. And C, if you think the answer is no, you don't really believe the reports. So can you answer the question, please? We'll, we'll take a little music if we can.
okay? And there's a lot of uncertainty here, which is good. I, I have a very strong view that if you take an imager and you put them up against a wall and you threaten to do terrible things to their vital organs, they will admit to you that they cannot easily distinguish between multiple small thrombi, which clearly may be very relevant here for the reasons Dr. Cardiel has already discussed, uh, and multiple vasculitis, multiple small vessel vasculitis. So that's just a little practice point to, uh, to entertain you with. We go on three months. She's doing well. She has no proteinuria or hematuria. She has a normal GFR. She has a normal kidney ultrasound, but she has become hypertensive, unequivocally hypertensive. Previously 90 over 60, now 160 over 100. So the question is, what's the cause and what's the treatment? Michelle, any thoughts about that one? When we see... Oh, sorry, Michelle. So Michelle she, Michelle. she went from the previous visit normal, yeah. so this is like just a month or yeah, so. Yeah, and we're seeing a monthly, so okay. you know, we know this is definitely sustained hypertension. So we know that she had the lupus anticoagulant, and so I'm a little bit concerned that maybe this is due to an antiphospholipid nephropathy. Absolutely right. Anybody disagree with that? Yes. Okay, yeah. and that was obviously our concern too. Now this was a very feisty patient, I, I, I might say. Um, she had no proteinuria, she had little protein, uh, sorry, no hematuria, little proteinuria, she was clearly hypertensive, but the renal biopsy would have shown, I'm sure had she had it because she refused to have it, this sort of appearance. And you can see uh, these clots uh, over here very clearly. Uh, that's a classic clot. And I've no doubt at all that this is what this patient actually had. Now, she was given enalapril to try to help resolve the, uh, the hypertension, and it worked very efficiently. We managed over the next couple of months to get the steroids down. She was stabilized on azathioprine 50 milligrams per day. But three months later, she developed what was truly I have to tell you, the most horrendous skin rash involving the whole body, really one of the worst I've ever seen, including a scalp. Uh, it looked somewhat vasculitic, but it was also blistering. Now, her father was a very tough guy, I've got to tell you, and he came to see me, and I got shouted at, actually, and he demanded a second opinion. And I was very fortunate in the sense that the, the, uh, the bilag group came to my rescue because the next day we happened to be having a bilag meeting and I was able to say to him, you want one second opinion tomorrow, I can give you eight second opinions. And it's been very nice to me ever since. So the question is, is this the drug? Is this the disease? How could one discriminate and what course of action should we take? So, so Murray, we've got a patient with hor truly horrendous rash. Is it the drug? Is it the disease? W what's your feeling? Well, I assume that her, her uh, lupus had seemed to be coming under control, That's right? correct, yeah. Um, and she's on 15 milligrams of prednisone. You would think you might look for other causes. Okay. And so the second opinion from the bilag group, I respect, but I would have got a dermatology consult. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a med biopsy if they weren't sure. Okay. Dr. Cardio, any thoughts about that? I agree. Every time we see these kind of things, so we, we of course want to ask if the patient is taking the medication, if she's taking something else that uh, she has not reported, and of course if, if, she, if she has had sun exposure. Yeah. So there is a history of enalapril, you can look this up, I'm sure a few of you will do, of, of it, divert, or co it causing late onset um, blistering eruptions, and that's kind of what we suspected it was. And you can see the high, uh, sorry, the lower power picture over here, there's the bullus over there, uh, you see it better under the higher power picture, very clearly over here, over there. Mm. But here's the vasculitis, which she also had. So it turns out this patient almost certainly had a combination of a drug-induced and a lupus vasculitis-induced problem. So this patient has now got this little issue of having a thrombotic tendency, but she's also got skin vasculitis, and not much doubt about that diagnosis. So we stopped the drug. That seemed reasonable to do. There was no speedy resolution of this rash, though. We increased the steroids at one point to 50 milligrams. She was on azathioprine. We did, in fact, consultant, uh, our dermatologist, Murray, we're pleased to know, who recommended, rather unusually perhaps, that we add methotrexate into the azathioprine with the high dose of steroids. And I have to say, the guy was right. Over a longish period of time, but persistently, she did get better. And apart from one exacerbation, when probably we reduced the steroids too quickly, the rash slowly faded, uh, but left her with un rather unsightly hyperpigmented skin patches. So, long-term concerns, a more broad question here. We've got a patient on steroids, azathioprine, methotrexate. So, Dr. Cardio, what's, you, you've told us a little bit about this already, but what sort of concerns would you have with a young patient uh, on these sorts of drugs? 
Uh, prednisone, these doses will be very toxic to her. Of course, yep. that's my main concern. Okay, so we're going to worry about osteoporosis and, and heart disease, just the way that, that uh, Michelle has, has told us about, and that's absolutely right. Over the next seven years, and this kind of gets into the territory that Murray has been talking about, she does very well. We stop the steroids and anticonvulsants. She trains as a primary school teacher. And then from July to September, seven years later, she develops recurrent fever, nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. She is admitted to hospital with a fever. She has diffuse abdominal tenderness, no other clinical features. But now, interestingly, the serologies have almost dissipated. The ANA is positive, but to one in 10 only. The anti-Rho is negative. The DNA binding was always negative, remains negative. We checked her anchor. Uh, we weren't able to do that before because the test didn't exist, but that's negative. Anticardilib antibodies, lupus anticoagulant previously uh, abnormal, were now normal. The C3 and the C4 were all normal. She has a chest x-ray, an echocardiogram, blood cultures, basically unremarkable. So we've got this patient with this abdominal pain and fever. So a simple question, really, Michelle, what, what would you want to do after this, or would you, in addition to, to work out what's going on here? Well, first, pretend she didn't have lupus and look for the usual causes. Yeah. So let's get stool cultures and yeah. ask about the travel history. But then you go where the money is. So I think she needs a CT angiogram, including mesenteric renal vessels, because I want to know very quickly has she clotted something, or is there a mesenteric vasculitis? And on the CT angio, I also should be able to look at the bowel to see if there's bowel wall edema that might suggest a lupus enteritis. Okay. Uh, we went for something slightly simpler. Uh, cheaper. Oh. <laughs> and cheaper. I'm bound to miss that one. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, we concluded in the end that she probably had just had cholecystitis. And it gets back to this point that I make, that a lupus patient developing a clinical feature, you mustn't always assume that that clinical feature is due to the lupus. It could just as easily be due to something else. And she was treated very successfully with uh, IV uh, cefiroxine. But here was the problem. Two days later, she gets a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, which leaves her with a mild left-sided hemiparesis and a brisk left upper limb jerk. So the question now to Murray is, what are we going to do now? Where, where are we going now with our investigations? Me? Yeah. Murray, yeah. So um, again, her lupus has been in inactive for a while. The question now is, has she had a recurrence of her lupus with neuropsychiatric disease? Or again, is this some incidental finding? Uh, or is this a result of damage Remember that she did have these either vasculitic or, or thrombotic lesions in her brain. Is that a focus and, and, uh, for a seizure development? So she needs a workup, a, a central nervous system workup. Thank you very much. Okay. And I entirely agree with that. The CSF was sterile. Slightly elevated protein, just two lymphocytes per mil. The Ooh. MRI scan showed that abnormalities said to be consistent with HS, uh, HSV encephalitis, but the HSV PCR was negative no oligoclonal bands were found. Incidentally, she has a CRP which is very high at 122, and as you will know, this is not traditionally high in mm -hmm. active lupus patients, apart from those with serositis or arthritis, and the SED rate is also very high. This was the picture on the uh, MRI scan. Now, this is highly, highly abnormal, as you can see. Okay, this is not the sort of appearance you want to see in anybody's brain, uh, let alone a patient who you think has got over her lupus. So we were, as you can imagine, rather concerned about that. And that's just another picture to uh, show you just how gross and diffuse the changes were. So her clinical condition deteriorated rapidly in spite of IV acyclovir, which we gave her just in case it might be helpful. The fever persists. The left hemiparesis gets worse. She becomes unconscious. An ECG, which we did, excludes seizure activity. So the question is, are there any other investigations which are needed? Should we measure the serum lead levels? Should we repeat the CSF? Should we repeat the MRI scan? Should we measure blood alcohol levels? Question for you in the audience. What would you do with this desperately ill patient? Where do you think we need to go? So you have an A, a B, a C, or D choice. We'll take the music. Let me know what you think. I want a brain biopsy. Of steroids, and most of you think re repeat the CSF, okay. We actually repeated the MRI. <laughs> and we showed that, that that scan that you saw, bad as it looked, was getting worse. 
And in something yeah, approaching desperation, I, I will be you. perfectly honest <laughs> with you, we did what I've only ever done three times in my career, in a lupus patient anyway, we did a brain biopsy. So the final question to the panel is this, what in your view were we likely to find in the brain biopsy of this desperately sick, unconscious lupus patient? Uh, and I got it completely wrong, <laughs> let's be uh, frank about that. So Michelle, what, 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 do, what do you think we were gonna turn up? Well, I hope you don't find PML because I've had a dreadful experience with PML yeah, right. where I've only had one person survive even after I stopped all immunosuppression and that one survivor had terrible cognitive impairment. So maybe anything else but PML. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe it's an, uh, a malignancy, maybe it's a fungal or other infection that can be treated. Okay. It just doesn't look like lupus to me though. Okay. Murray. I think this is infection. And I think I'd like you to tell me how many grams of steroids she's had over all of these years. Lots. <laughs> Lots of grams. And uh, I, th I think you'll find some infectious agent. Dr. Cardiel. I have, a, I have had some patients like this and uh, with biopsy who were diagnosed with uh, leukoencephalopathy. Encephalopathy, okay. I thought I was going to find a, a, um, a lymphoma. That, that was where my money was going. But I was wrong. And in fact, what we found, rather amazingly, was isolated cerebral vasculitis. And I will what? give you the report. Biopsy reported chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate around the small penetrating vessels and white matter capillaries and calves. Diagnosis, small vessel vasculitis. She was given IV methylprednisolone and monthly IV, IV cyclo for three months. She was switched to long-term low-dose low oral prednisolone and azathioprine, and I'm very happy oral to report recovery? that she made a full recovery and she returned to teaching. So to summarize, a 14-year-old girl had presented yes. with ITP, representing tw 10 years later with what was clearly lupus linked to APS, which is manifested by fever, arthritis, alopecia, CNS problems, positive ANA, positive lupus anticoagulant, and a low C3. Uh, after the little glitch we had with the drug, which was accompanied with a small vessel vasculitis of the skin, but was clearly at least partly due to the drug, she represented with fever, abdominal pain, and convulsion, and even in the absence of any uh, autoantibodies, was found on brain biopsy to have a cerebral vasculitis, which responded very well to steroids, cyclophosphamide, and azathioprine. But I thought the panel gave it a great shot. I'd like you to applaud them. I did <laughs> a great tried. Thank you. So you've very kindly given me a range of questions, so I'm now going to put a few of these to the audience. Um, and one question to, to start with, shh, be quiet please. Um, Murray, one question which they, the audience would like to ask you is this. Which method of anti DNA antibodies were you using, uh, an ELISA or a Crithidia, and do you think high avidity anti DNA binding of far assay w would have found some differences? Uh, what was it? With the shh. method that... The method that we use is the FAR, and because we've done studies in show, uh, comparing FAR and ELISA, and FAR certainly correlates much better with disease activity than ELISA. If we're forced to interpret ELISA from elsewhere, like Michelle, we ask, like Michelle's uh, uh, new criteria, we ask that the ELISA be significantly elevated, but okay. we certainly prefer and rely on the FAR. Now, we've had a very interesting question about hydroxychloroquine and whether or not hydroxychloroquine should result in patients having their eyes tested. There's been a bit of a move away against that, uh, although those of you who heard the, uh, the pediatric session yesterday heard that the pediatricians, somewhat surprisingly in my mind anyway, are still recommending it on an annual basis. So I wanted to ask our, our, our three colleagues what they do currently with their patients on plaque. So start with, with, uh, uh, with Michelle. So the new rules say that after a baseline exam, you don't need to do anything for five years but our ophthalmologists aren't going to change, so our patients are still going yearly. My problem is with the new high technology, the OCT and the ERG, where I'm having outside ophthalmologists tell my patients that there is an abnormality and therefore they should stop their Plaquenil. And when I get a second opinion from our Hopkins ophthalmologist, usually it's from something else, a hypertensive retinopathy, even a lupus retinopathy, a diabetic retinopathy, or something genetic. So I fear high technology scaring my patients into stopping hydroxychloroquine unnecessarily. 
Murray, what do you do? Uh, we do once a year. Uh, I don't even do a screening unless the patient's significantly older. It's do once a year. I try very hard to refer to the same ophthalmologist that I have trained. <laughs> and in Mexico, what do we do in Mexico? I do it every, every two years with hydroxychloroquine. Okay. Question for Michelle. Which patient diagnoses were more likely to be misclassified as lupus with the new criteria? The control population was nearly every rheumatic disease you see, included things like Sjogren's, myositis, RA. So there wasn't any particular misclassification that we could pin to one of these particular control patients. Okay. And a question from Dr. Cardiel. How long does it take to do one of the standard disease activity measures, uh, for example, the SLEED-A or the BILAC? Do, do, do you have personal experience with that? Yes, the SLEED A, we do have all the lab tests, will take three to five minutes, but uh, the BILAC will take probably 15. So I have to say, I profoundly disagree with that, but uh, you would expect me to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for most patients doing a BILAC form, provided you've got your nurses to do the blood pressures and to check the urine, for most patients you can, you can do it in five minutes or even less, actually. Question for Murray. Can you comment on the use of complement digestion products, C3A, C3D, C4D, any, any additional value over and above the C3 and C4? No, I'm, I, I wouldn't make a comment because we have no experience and I don't know large studies that have correlated them as yeah. more useful than just total okay. C3. And another question to Murray. Do you believe there might be a role for anti-chromatin positive, uh, uh, or what, I think it's what, what it's asking is, do you see patients who are anti-DNA negative but who are anti-chromatin positive, and would you use that uh, to sort of follow those patients up? Yeah, that's an interesting question, whether that's a more specific anti-nuclear antibody. I, I, I'm now not speaking from data because we haven't compared, we haven't looked at anti-DNA negative patients, but I would put a lot of weight on that. If they had anti-nucleosome antibody, anti-chromatin antibody, even if they were anti-DNA negative, I would count that as positive serology. Okay. And for Dr. Cardio, we have a very uh, a controversial question. Is it valid to use only the physician's global assessment as a measurement of lupus activity? It's much better that only the subjective measure of non, moderate, and severe. I think that's an advancement, and I think I will prefer to see that instead of only this is an active patient. And you have to validate that because uh, it has been proven in many, in many clinical settings as an, an important advancement. And I, I'd like to take Murray's and, and Michelle's view on, on the use of the Physicians Global in the absence of anything else. So uh, something is better than nothing. Uh, but the better, the, the, the most standardized you can make it, the better. So I would actually use, for the Physician Global, a Likert scale type of uh, 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 Physician Global. In other words, the same, a, lot, a little better, a lot better, cured, and then a little worse, a lot worse, dead. So, uh, so at least you have something to go on. And you know, that only works if it's the same physician that sees them each time because everybody judges things a little bit differently. So, as much as it can be standardized, the better. Okay, Michelle? The Physician Global Assessment actually worked quite well in one of the BLISS studies. So, I think it can work. Again, I agree, one physician. But if you're gonna use visual analog scales, why not use one for each organ? because many of your patients will have multi-organ involvement. And when you see them at the next visit, it's nice to look at the visual analog for each one. And we'll go back to the last couple of questions. One is about how long you can use Plaquenil for. Do any of you guys have a restriction in your mind as to could you take Plaquenil for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Any feeling yes. about that? I have patients who have true Plaquenil retinopathy. It does happen. Just like you, I have the patients that have the hyperpigmentation without retinopathy, and I ask those patients, what is better, to die early from lupus or to put up with some hyperpigmentation? And you'll be amazed how often my patients disagree with me about what the <laughs> priorities are. <laughs> mm. uh, Murray, how long would you treat a, a patient with So that? I tell my patients that I expect them to be on for life. Mm -hmm. The big question is, 
what is the maintenance dose that one should use? Yep. So the induction dose, we all talk about six milligrams per kilogram, etc. But once they're in remission, what is an appropriate maintenance dose? And the answer is nobody knows. But our practice is once they've been in remission for a good number of years is to decrease the dose somewhat. Now, if you ask me how low, no data. I do the same and I tend to decrease the dose. I start decreasing from Monday to Friday and, and free weekend holidays. And if the patient is doing fine, I do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday maintenance dose. That's well, ladies and gentlemen, I think the, we, we've tortured the panel enough. Uh, they've given a fantastic uh, set of responses and some lovely talks. I'd like you to thank them in the traditional way, please. Thank you.